And so our empowerment series kind of falls underneath Vision 2020. And three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, Casey talked on empowering warnings. Um, last week, Mitch preached and talked about empowering encouragement. Like we're, we're called to be encouraging one another, to build each other up. And he said most of the time we, we operate on an encouragement deficit. Like we, we remember the times that people encourage us because it's so, it, it's, it's so refreshing. And so this week we're moving on to empowering vulnerability. Um, empowering vulnerability. And so uh, I kind of thought I, I would share with you guys, mo most of the places, most of like the spaces in my life are shared. Like I, I'm not like, I don't ever have a place that's totally mine all the time. Like I, I'm married, my wife and I have an apartment, and so like I can't just live like it's mine, otherwise that goes bad real quick. <laughs> um, and when I come to work, like it's a shared office, it's like not my place, but the one place that's kind of mine is my car. Like that's like my own little bomb of, of like my world. And so um, when, when I like, when I think about my car, it's, it's, it's just always gross, like it is. I'm not a clean car person. Some of you guys are clean car people, I'm not. There's like coffee cups, there's sweatshirts, there's like flip-flops, it's just, it's just always a mess. And sometimes I get in there and I'm like, man, I'm so glad this isn't my whole life. Like, this is just my car. Um, I'm like taking corners and coffee cups are clanking in the back seat. Like that, and, and actually I learned this morning that it's not just me, it's a family thing, because my nephew is here and he tells me when he gets out of the car today, he's like, dude, I got out and I really, <laughs> sorry dude, he goes, he goes, I realized there was three Little Caesars boxes from three separate times I had gone to Little Caesars all in my car. <laughs> so it's a, it's a family thing. Um, it's a family thing. If somebody needs a ride, I'm like doing the, the two-hand shovel of stuff into the, into the back seat. Like, yeah, just give me a minute. Like, <laughs> and there's just this growing like trash mountain in the back seat of my car. This is me. Um, but, but I think at, at times it, the, my car could almost look like an episode of Hoarders. Have you guys seen this show? So here, here, here's, here's sort of the deal with hoarders. It's basically this. These, these people have, um, you know, a lot of times like crazy pasts and even um, disorders and things like that, but they, they like, their homes are crazy full of stuff, way too much stuff, and they have trouble getting rid of the stuff. Um, sometimes they're even in, in denial um, about having too much stuff. Um, and so I looked it up, and on the website it says this. This is like the purpose of the show. This is the summary. With the help of expert therapists and organizers, the hoarders will attempt to unlock their key obsessions, or the key to their obsessions, in the hope of reclaiming their lives. And so there's like a couple aspects to this show. Like the first one is pretty important. Like you have to be on the show. And to be on the show, you have to be willing to expose sort of like the realist version of you. You have to open up the door to your house, and you're not cleaning up before people come over. <laughs> Like, you're opening up the door, people are coming in, they're coming in with a camera crew, and you know it's going to be broadcast, and you're like, this is me. Like, a lot of times, there's just stuff stacked to the ceiling, and that's like crazy transparency. To let people into your mess, to expose your mess, um, and, and to know that, like, I mean, when, you, when people watch Hoarders, they're not like, I mean, people are ruthless. <laughs> They're, they're, you know people are going to make judgments about you watching the show. You know people are going to maybe not respond in the way that you, you would hope. And so there's like a little bit of risk. You're opening yourself up. You're inviting people into your mess knowing that there's a risk. But I'm thinking like, why do people do that? Why would you go on that show? And it's because the hope of like a different life on the other side is good and is like enough hope that they would say like, yeah, come on in. And so they open up their homes um, with this radical transparency and there's risk, but somebody else comes in and is the solution. I think that's important because it's not a show about how these people like just really figure it out and they start working on their problem and little by little, like it's, they do it on their own strength. They're like done. They're like, this is it, this is me, hope you can help. And somebody else comes in and is the solution. See, they expose their mess so somebody else can be the solution. As we talk about empowering vulnerability, I just sat on my Bible. <laughs> As we talk about empowering vulnerability, we, we ha I want to sort of unpack vulnerability before we jump into our passage. So, so to be vulnerable is just to be, to be real. Like to, to be real about your brokenness, about 
your struggles, about your past, like to just sort of let people in and be like, this is me. We're opening ourselves up to risk a lot of times when we do that, when you let people see what's really going on. And here's what vulnerability does. Vulnerability deconstructs the lie that you have it all together. And we love that lie. Like, we love it. I want people to believe that lie about me, and I believe that lie about other people. Like, I, like man, they got it figured out. Like, their family's perfect, their relationships are perfect, they're like super in shape. Man, like, when you're going through their Instagram, like, this is a perfect person. This is the first one, second one, this is the second one. Um, we, we love that lie. And vulnerability says the, the total opposite. Vulnerability says, hey, everything is not great with me. I've got problems, and I, I need some help. I can't, like, dig myself out of this. I actually need somebody else to, like, come in and help me with this. And so before we jump into 2 Timothy, which is where this study is, um, we'll finish out 2 Timothy today. I, I want to look at one passage from a different book that I think sort of answers the question of why. Like, why, why, why should I be vulnerable? How does vulnerability in the gospel, like, how do those things go together? And so I want to look at one verse um, from 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. And this is another letter written by Paul. And listen to what he says. And he's talking about Jesus here. So Paul's going to quote Jesus. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I'm, I'm just going to read it again, because that's, that's a truth that, we, that, we, that I need to be reminded of over and over and over and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And if you choose to check out, like, for the rest of the day, which is cool, because I've done that a lot of times in church, because I grew up in church, I've totally checked out, listen to this, vulnerability makes Jesus the Savior so that you don't have to be. Vulnerability makes Jesus the Savior so that you don't have to be. Because in, in a world that celebrates people who have it all together, the gospel says the opposite. And it's hard for us because we're gospel people living in a world, and we can easily fall into the rhythm of our society that says, you need to have it all together. Look at these people who have it all together, and the gospel says the opposite. So like I said, that's sort of just setting the stage, and now we're, we're going to jump into our uh, passage here for this morning, finishing up 2 Timothy. And on, on the surface, like a lot of times in the New Testament, especially in the letters, like it can kind of seem like at the end, and even sometimes at the beginning, like this is just a little intro, doesn't really mean anything. This is just kind of Paul signing off, like, and then in the middle is like where the really good stuff is. And so we're, we're looking at like the very last part of this letter. And it's like a lot of personal instructions and like it can seem like, well, maybe there's not a lot of truth in there, but that's not the case. We were just reminded last week when Mitch preached that all scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So as we look at this passage today, here's sort of the context. Paul, Paul is written, writing this letter. Okay, and, and if you don't know, quickly, Paul was... Um, he, he used to be like a persecutor of the church. He would go and he would actually arrest Christians. He wanted this whole Jesus thing to stop. He would go into people's homes, take them, throw them in jail. Like, that was his mission. Stop this Jesus thing. And then one day, Paul's like on his way to stop the Jesus thing, and Jesus appears to him and totally transforms his life. Totally changes his life. He understands who Jesus is, and he, he does a 180. He was going this way, he meets Jesus, and now Paul's going this way. That's like what happens when you meet Jesus. It's really awesome. And so now this person who was persecuting the church is now, he's a missionary and he's a preacher and he's planting churches. And so when we pick up in 2 Timothy, this is like, this is actually the last letter that we have of Paul. So at this point, he's like an old dude and he's been in ministry 
And he's writing this to Timothy, who's, who he's like mentoring. He's discipling. He's training Timothy up. He's a younger pastor. And so we get a glimpse, like a little bit of a different glimpse into Paul here because of the context. He's in prison in Rome. It's the second time. He, he was in prison. He got freed, and then he got thrown back in prison. And this time it's not good, and he knows that. And so he's writing this letter to his, like the, the person, the young pastor that he's discipling, and he knows, like, time is of the essence. This, this is urgent. I don't have much time left, probably. Okay? And so we pick it up, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22. It's a chunk, so bear with me. Here we go, verse 9. Paul says, Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. And get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. <clears throat> Listen to this. At, at my first defense, like the first time that Paul went before the, before the Roman authority, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me this message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And he goes on, and he says, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Got it. Had to practice that one. Um, Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So Claire and I don't have kids yet, but when we do, I think Putin's is going to be top of the list. <laughs> Baby Putin's. Putin's powers. It's, it just flows. So, so I, I've told you guys before, like, man, when I get to preach, I get super excited and equally excited and also, like, horrified at the same time. It's a, it's a both. Like, there, there's like, I, I, I love it, but it's something that's very intimidating to me, and I, I've got to be reminded of truth over and over, and you guys are amazing at that. So thank you for doing that. Um, and so I got this passage, and I went and I read it, and I was like, oh, <laughs> like, bring me my coat and say hi to my friends? Like, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Um, but, but, like, it's so true of Scripture, man. As you, as you get into it and you start engaging with the Word and you start engaging with the Holy Spirit, there's so, so, so much truth packed into this passage. Okay. Um, and so I lost my place here. Here we go. Um, as is always true with the Word of God, as, as we get into it, we, we get to just in, um, engage with His truth. And so there's, there's four elements of a culture of empowerment that I want to look at from this perspective. Remembering, we've got to remember like who Paul is, who Timothy is, and, and where Paul is writing from. Those things are key to understanding this passage. So the first one is this. Empowering vulnerability takes the first step. There's like urgency from Paul here. He says, look, make every effort to come to me soon. He, he's, exp he's like, yo, I, I need help. Things are not good here. I, I'm struggling. I'm in a bad spot. Um, I'm lonely. He's sitting in like a cold prison cell. Um, he's come soon. He, he's not concerned with, at that point, what will Timothy think of me? Like, this kid looks up to me. I'm supposed to be like this, this awesome pastor and missionary. Like, like if, I, if I tell him I'm struggling, I tell him my needs, like, man, what's, what's that going to do to like my reputation? That's not what he's concerned about because 
Paul, all, all through his, his discipleship of Timothy, he's not concerned with making another Paul or making a follower of Paul. He's very clear about his struggles and his sin all throughout First and Second Timothy. Okay, because he's concerned with Timothy following and following love, following and falling in love with Jesus and not just becoming another Paul. And I, I think we have a tendency when we look up to someone to, to like idolize that person or put them on a pedestal. And that's not what Paul's doing. He's very real about his needs in this moment. And so he says, look, come to me. I, I'm, not only do I have all these needs, I miss you. Like, I've been abandoned. So he's leaning into that first step of saying, like, hey, I, I need help. And so a culture of empowering vulnerability takes that first step, and that's not always an easy first step to take. Like, it, when you're in a group of people and you're going to be the first one to kind of step in and be vulnerable, that's not easy. That's not easy, but, but as we become a church of people who are willing to do that, who are willing to say like, hey, don't have it all together, here's, here's my stuff. Like that's how a culture changes, and, and, it, and what it does is it deconstructs Paul and it raises up Jesus. That's what, that's what it does. It's not an easy thing to do. It's scary to be the first person to lean into vulnerability, but that's what Paul does, and I believe that's what Paul calls us to do as well. Number two, empowering vulnerability is descriptive. So we read through those, those specific names of specific people doing specific things. And he says the first one is Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me. And so Demas was like a, he, he worked with Paul. He was in the trenches of ministry with Paul. They, they, they worked together to build up the church, and all of a sudden, like this close friend, this associate who'd been working with him, going got rough, and he totally bailed. And like, imagine, imagine being Paul. Like, that's your teammate, that's your brother, that's your coworker. Things get rough, things get dangerous, and he's out. I read this commentary that said this, Demas was a fair-weather disciple who never counted the cost of genuine commitment to Christ. Times are good, Demas is there. Thing, things, things go bad, it's unpopular to be a Christian, Demas is out. Let that not be us. Let that not be us. That we would be willing to be on board with this Jesus thing as much as it suits us, and when it doesn't, we're out. Paul goes on and he, he describes what's going on in these different cities and sending his different friends as missionaries, as leaders, as, as like gospel proclaimers to these different cities. Remember where Paul is at. I'm not doing that if I'm in a Roman prison. Like, if I'm in a Roman prison, I feel so bad for me. I'm, I'm so, I'm probably mad, I'm sad, I'm thinking, how could this happen to me? God, I thought you were for me. This is the worst. I was your ambassador, and now everybody's deserted me. I'm sitting in this prison cell. Like, that, that's where my heart would go very quickly. Not, hey, how's the church in Thessalonica doing, and who's ministering there? Like, that's Paul's heart. Even in such drastic circumstances, he is, he is worried about gospel proclamation. It's like the original Church United. Like, like, he's not just concerned about him and the church in Rome. He, he wants the gospel to go forward and advance through these different men to these different cities. That's the heart of Paul, even in such dire circumstances. And then lastly, under descriptive, um, it says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. And, and so I was reading, they don't know if, if like, he, was, he actually played a part in Paul's arrest, or maybe he testified against him, um, but at one point they were working together and then he turned on him and he did him great harm. And so Paul, remember he's writing to Timothy, he's like, Yo, dude, look out. Like, watch out for this guy. I don't know how long I'm going to be around, but you need to protect yourself and you need to protect the gospel message. Because what was happening as people were trying to like squash this Jesus thing um, is there were like a lot of people popping up and preaching a false gospel, false teachers. And Paul says, 
Protect yourself. Protect the gospel message. And this dude right here is bad news. He's twisting it. He turned on me. And if I'm gone, the gospel needs to go forward. He, he's being a spiritual father to Timothy still in his last days. Uh, number three, empowering vulnerability is hopeful. This one's my favorite. This one's my favorite. Empowering vulnerability is hopeful. Paul talks about his first defense, and so he, he goes before the Roman authorities um, and kind of pleads his case and is thrown back in prison while they decide what to do with him. Um, and he knows it didn't go well, so he knows what's probably coming. He says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. And again, that's where the period would be if I was writing this. But he goes on and he says, may it not be charged against them. Even in such wrongdoing to himself, he says, but, but may it not be charged against them them. And we've got to understand, like, to, to take the gospel to Rome, Rome was like New York City. So that was, that was Paul's, like, greatest thing. Like, he wanted to take the gospel to Rome, and he was tasked with taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And so his, he, he finally gets to Rome. He fi like, this is the pinnacle of his ministry. He's fulfilling his personal calling of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And he finally gets in front of Roman authorities. And who's there? Nobody. Everybody that was like, rah, rah, Paul, gospel, let's do it. Roman authorities, gone. And he's, he is left alone to fulfill his personal calling and his greatest, um, his greatest missional moment. Does that remind you of anybody else? Does that remind you of anybody else? And saying, may it not be charged against them. Where else in Scripture do we see someone who is totally abandoned by their peers in the, pinnacle of their in the pinnacle of their ministry testifying to the gospel before the very men who would take their life? That's Christ. That's Christ. And yet he says about those people who left him, who abandoned him when, th when going got hard, he says, let it not be charged against them. This passage, like all of this book, points us right back to Jesus, right back to Christ. See, Paul knows, Paul knows in a very real way what it means to be an enemy of God. Like, he, he was persecuting the church. He was trying to stop churches. He was arresting Christians. Like, some of you probably have crazy pasts. We all have crazy pasts, but, like, maybe you weren't arresting Christians. Like, that, that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. And, and so he knows what it means to be an enemy of God. But here, here's what's true. The Bible says that we're all enemies of God because we are all sinners. We, we've all committed crimes against a holy God. God's holy and righteous and perfect, and we are not. And so what happens when you sin against a holy and righteous God is you're now a criminal. The standard is perfection, which none of us can meet. And we are criminals against God. And the sentence for being a criminal, the Bible says, is death. The punishment for sin is death and separation from God. It's like, oh man, that sounds like kind of intense. Like, I do my best. You know, I'm not perfect. I get that. But like, here's the deal. If, if God didn't punish sin, then he wouldn't be a just God. He, he wouldn't be holy. Like, if there, was no, if there was no punishment for crimes in our society, it would be chaos. It would be chaos. We wouldn't look at that society and say, that is good. And yet God is good, and so he must punish sin. And so with, with us being criminals against God, having punishment coming our way, like that's pretty bad. That's really bad, but that's not the end of the story. See, God, in his great love for us, even though we turned our back on him, all of us, he sent Jesus, and Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live. He, he never had that label of criminal against God. He never did. Because he was holy and righteous and perfect where we couldn't have been. And so what Jesus did on the cross is he, when he went to the cross, everybody knows Jesus died on the cross. Everybody knows that. Christian, not Christian, we get that. But when he went to the cross blameless, 
spotless, perfect, holy. The, the punishment that we deserved was death, not him. And so he took that label of criminal, he took that sentence of death, and he said, call me a criminal, give me the death. Because God's got to punish this or he wouldn't be just. And God punished Jesus in my place. And he suffered death that he didn't deserve. And he suffered separation from God that he never had experienced before. And he was dead. And three days later, he proved that he was stronger than sin and he was stronger than death because he rose in the flesh having dealt with that problem, having paid that bill. And now he offers you and I freedom, freedom from our sin. Freedom from the sin that is like, has got you and you can't get away from it. And you can't seem to beat it. You can't. But with the Holy Spirit, guys, it, it changes everything. When we put our faith and our trust in Christ and his death and resurrection, that he paid that price that we deserved as sinners, I'm no longer an enemy of God, but instead he now adopts me. He takes this once criminal and says, you're a son. He says that you're a son. You, you are spotless. You're clean. As clean as Jesus was in his life, that's the trade you made. You received Jesus' holy, righteous perfection even though we turned our back on God. And, and not only do we get like, to walk with Jesus and, and live in that freedom on this life, but once we suffer, once we go to be with Christ, we're with him forever, like enjoying his presence for all time. And see, that is the message that Paul had to get out. Like, regardless of what happens to me, people need to know what Christ has done. And so he's in the pinnacle of his ministry, standing before the Roman authority, and he says, everyone deserted me. And it's fine, because <laughs> that's not what it's about. Everyone deserted me, but the Lord stood by me. You can be deserted, you can be abandoned, but you will never be alone, because the Lord stands by us. And not only did Jesus stand by Paul before that Roman authority, but Jesus stands by Paul when he meets his father. And he said, no, no, he's, he's with me. I've purchased him. This isn't a criminal. This is a son. That's who, that's who our Savior is. So number three, or number four, I'm sorry, empowering vulnerability is attractive. That, that story that I just described is not a story about how we, like, we figured it out, we got it together, we cleaned ourselves up, and we're good with God. It's the total opposite. That's not the gospel. It's a story about our total and complete brokenness and hopelessness and criminal standing before God until Jesus came and redeemed us from all of that. So as we talk about empowering vulnerability, to pretend like we have it together is totally backwards. It's totally backwards. When we pretend we have it together, we want the glory for ourselves. We got it. I'm good. Everything's good. I'm great. As I lean into my brokenness and my pain and my past and, and, and like my sin, Jesus is glorified. Jesus is glorified. There have been a couple times um, in my life where men, men that I look up to, um, men in, in ministry even, have been vulnerable with me. And then like, dude, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Or, or, or like, this sin has, has creeped up. Or, or like, they've just, they've just been real. And like, men that I look up to. And so, what happened in those moments is not all of a sudden I think, well, they were lying the whole time. <laughs> They're sinners. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> that what happened in that moment is, is like, all of a sudden, our desire and need for Jesus just sort of like skyrocketed. And we went to him, and I have so much more respect and so much more love after those moments for those men because it's real. It's not about being perfect. It's not about having it all together. It's about being vulnerable and letting the Holy Spirit do its work. So um, just a, a quick recap. Vulnerability makes Jesus the Savior so that we don't have to be. To, to, to open up the doors and invite people in to like, yo, this is me, this is real, and it's not perfect, so that somebody else can come in. You know why? Because his power is made perfect 
in our weakness. His power is made perfect in our weakness. So let's be a church. Let's be a church who makes much of Jesus, who are quick, quick to let other people into our brokenness, quick to let other people into our mess, to be the first one to open up that door so that somebody else can, so that the Holy Spirit can begin to work and sanctify us, to invite other people into that brokenness so that Jesus' power can be made perfect. That's a culture. That's a culture of empowering vulnerability. And, and I'll just say, when, when a spiritual father, for those of you that are Paul's and have Timothy's, when you are vulnerable and you lead in vulnerability to a Timothy, I will tell you from experience, that is so empowering and it is so freeing and it is so glorifying to Jesus from the perspective of a Timothy. But sometimes that's hard to do as a Paul because we're supposed to have it all together. But that's such a lie. That is not what the gospel says. And so um, I'm going to invite the band back up and we're going to close for just a few more minutes. But I just want to ask you, like, what, do, what, do we do, what do we do with this, with these ideas now? Because as I'm thinking through like applications and maybe challenges or, or whatever for this message, it's like there, there's two groups of people in this room. And, and the application is totally different for these two groups of people. See, some, some of you, like, you, you know what we're talking about within a culture of empowerment. And you have a bench. You have Timothy's. You, you, you are a spiritual leader. And so to you, I would say, man, what's, what's it going to take for you to, for you to lead in, for you to be the first end of vulnerability, for you to take the first step to expose your weakness that might hurt your pride, but it glorifies Jesus because that's where his power is made perfect. Maybe there's an area of sin in your life that you haven't confessed. I'll give you a clue, there is, <laughs> because that stuff is deep. Like As soon as you get part of it figured out, there's more in there. So maybe, maybe you haven't even confessed that to God, far less taken that into community and been vulnerable. Maybe we need to be honest about the sin in our heart and, and say, hey, I... I'm in need. I need you. I need help. Because I don't have as much of the Bible memorized as I should, but I, I do have this verse that says, when, when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to purify us from all unrighteousness. That's who Jesus is, and that's a promise. That's a promise. And so to those of you without Timothy's, who maybe wouldn't, wouldn't claim Christianity. Maybe you're not quite sure about all this. I would encourage you that, that you have a Savior who was willing to be, put himself at a lot of risk so that you could know him, so that you can walk with him. And this whole thing is not about having it all together. It's about owning the fact that we don't because his grace is sufficient for us and his power is made perfect in our weakness. So we're going we're gonna to go back into a time of worship. There's going to be prayer partners up front. I would encourage you to just ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit maybe to convict you of sin, maybe for the first time, to see where, where can I embrace my brokenness so that Jesus, you can be glorified. We're going to have prayer partners up front if you'd like to come pray um, with somebody. Let's worship together. And I got a special announcement now. I'm going to ask Sam and the youth team to come up. So the youth team, uh, youth, we didn't have a youth ministry a year ago. And so Sam's come up. The youth team, come on up. All of you, if you come up, I want to pray for you guys. Youth ministry, uh, what's going on in our youth ministry is nothing short of miraculous. There's people being, there's some of them been baptized. They're growing and loving one another. They're serving. They're on mission. Uh, they're combining with Trinity, as Sam said. And uh, Sam's now uh, has got dual citizenship. He's working here at the Avenue and at Trinity. He's part of that collaborative effort with Trinity. And we're super excited with what's happening in our youth ministry. And so this next week... Tomorrow, as a matter of fact, a number of the students are heading with Trinity to Daytona Beach for Passion Camp. 
And so they're going to be gone for this week, and they're going to be worshiping and loving one another and serving. And so we would just want to send them out in prayer. Yeah, can you give a big round of applause for our youth ministry? God is moving mightily through our youth ministry, and I just want to pray for them uh, and send them out in prayer. And so if you would, just bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the good work that you're doing in our youth ministry. Lord, thank you for new life, Lord. Thank you for those that have been baptized, Lord. Thank you for the friendships that have been formed, the bonds, Lord, that they have been welcomed into a new family, Lord. We're thankful for that. We pray for the trip this week. We want to lift up every one of them that are going on their trip to Daytona. We want to pray that you would open their hearts to receive exactly what you would have for them, Lord, that your spirit would anoint the trip in a special way, that you would provide safety and provision for their trip to and from Daytona, and that you would transform them in small and in big ways, and that you would grow them closer to one another, and that you would give them great vulnerability as they go. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, proclaim a benediction over you, and uh, you'll be excused. To the God who can do far more than we can ever hope or imagine, would he encourage you today to be vulnerable as you head out? I love you guys. Pray this in Christ's name. Thank you so much.